we are live. Fantastic. And we even have five minutes to spare. For anyone looking at the YouTube, could you uh, please let me, or can you please confirm that um, uh, that we are getting uh, the right uh, live stream on the uh, YouTube channel? And it may have a, you know, like a 15 second delay or something. Okay, I'm looking at it right now, actually. We look good. Testing, testing, testing audio, testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, testing, testing, testing audio. Testing, testing. Testing, testing, testing. Okay, audio is good. Let me try this also from the headphones in just a moment because I there's a truck making quite a bit of noise outside and I think maybe with the headphones that'll be better. So just gonna plug those in. Okay, I'm on the headphones now. Testing, testing, testing. I There's a truck making quite a bit of noise outside, and I think maybe with the headphones that'll be better, so I'm just going to plug those in. Okay, I'm on the headphones now. Testing, testing, testing. Hmm. Is it possible that the headphones are actually more quiet than the the regular just microphone and speaker? Well, they both seem yeah. clearer. Oh. I couldn't hear you with the headphones. Or it was very quiet at least for me. For a second. I uh, it it uh, seemed okay though coming through the um the YouTube the YouTube live stream though. Does it? And how about now uh, in terms of just hearing me directly? I couldn't hear you with the headphones. Can you hear me now though, Alicia? Yeah. Okay, so I guess with the headphones, I have to actually hold that little microphone right to my mouth. That's a bit annoying. But it does pick up less of the surrounding sound. And I hate having to make choices like this, but... Well, Michael, which one do you suggest? Do you suggest I use the speaker and the microphone directly from my phone or the headphones with this holding this right in front of my mouth? Yeah. Okay, so I guess... Um, I would recommend uh, whichever one you were you were just using. Okay, that's the microphone and the headphones, I mean, earbuds and microphone and just holding it in front of my mouth. 
I want to use whatever is the clearest when it gets onto the stream, but also for our direct communication. Also, Michael, um, during the presentation, you're going to have to turn off your speakers or use headphones or something because I can actually hear the 15-second delayed version of myself coming through. Okay. Or maybe it was because your microphone's on. Oh, that must be it. Because, okay, you can listen to me on the speakers, but then you have to have your microphone muted because you can't have it going back in to our meet uh, conversation. Okay. Sorry, yeah, I know this sort of stuff is it's just annoying to have to learn. It's the easiest when the administrator is somebody who can be totally cut off, basically someone who is just wearing headphones and listening to the audio of the production, but who is themselves not at all involved in the conversation. And I know that's not the case here because you have to be able to ask questions too. But yeah, that's, I guess it's not the ideal case. Okay. Hey, it looks like it's 11 o'clock. So we should probably get going soon. I have no idea how many people are here now. Maybe we should wait a little bit longer if there's still people missing. I say I have no idea because I'm not actually looking at the meet session. I'm only looking at the presentation. over for a moment because I'd like to have some idea. Oh, okay, there are nine people or eight people. That's not bad. Michael Cirillo is there as well. That's very nice. Yeah, I guess we can probably get going and then whoever still shows up, shows up. I'll give it one more minute. All right, everyone, let me switch over to the presentation again. It's still the same people, so I'm guessing these are the people that will show up here. Um, okay, turning that back on. Right. I hope I'm still in presenter mode. Um, if I'm not, Michael, please do let me know. Um, you should be seeing my slide right now, the first slide. Anyhow, um, unless I get some kind of notice otherwise, I'm assuming everything's fine. Um, I'm basically just going to run through this and assume that we do our conversation about it afterward. But if there is something that really irks you, where you think, I really want to ask a question right now, then please do. Um, I don't think this is going to be very complicated, Journal Club. Uh, the papers that we chose 
are reviews, and they aren't particularly deep, although they do give some insight into um, what has been achieved with C. elegans and what hasn't been achieved, and the main consensus around what you can do with a connectome versus what other studies are necessary. So with that, let me get started. Uh, this is, I don't know which it is now, the third in our series of uh, Carbon Copies Foundation Journal Club. And um, I thank you for Michael and Abulfaz for doing their, um, their presentations the last two times. And uh, this time, uh, the presentation is mine, and it's about uh, From Connectome to Brain Function which is uh, directly copied from the title of the first paper that we'll be discussing. There are two papers that were sent out as the materials for this journal club. One of them was the uh, paper by Bargman and Eve Martyr from the connectome to brain function that was published in Nature Methods from 2013. And the second one is a De Loreto et al. paper that is much more recent. It's a 2019 paper, Novel Technological Advances in Functional Connectomics and C. elegans that was published in the Journal of Developmental Biology. And right out the gate, I should mention that, of course, the De Loreto paper is a little bit newer in the sense that it mentions a few methods that are slightly more advanced or that have come a little further since the Martyr paper was published. But having said that, the two papers really do end up coming to the same conclusions. And in terms of the writing style, I would say the Martyr paper is somewhat easier to read, has somewhat better language, and uh, just gets to the point a little bit quicker, whereas the De Loreto paper tries, um, tries hard to squeeze in mentions of a lot of different methods, but without getting into enough detail to really describe those methods. So eh, it's a balance. Personally, I think the Martyr paper is slightly better. Um, but yeah, there you go. Okay, so what both of them really get to is this question. What kind of information do you need beyond the connectivity diagrams to understand the function of our nervous systems? And uh, to make this clear, let me just say that when we talk about connectomics, when we talk about using the structural information from a preserved brain to create an upload or a whole brain emulation, we usually mean more than what they're talking about here. Because when they say the connectivity diagrams, they really just mean the diagram that says this neuron is connected to that neuron, often without any additional information. No information about synaptic strength, no information about the types of channel receptors, no information about the dynamics of the neurons. Just there are these neurons over here and they connect to those neurons over there and so forth. That's the basic connectivity diagram. That is the, the most bare bones in terms of uh, connectomics that you can get. And often that's, that's what's meant by the connectome. And then when you get further, then people talk about the synaptome and the proteome, et cetera. Okay, so we're talking about the function of the nervous system. The function of the nervous system is of course uh, achieved by the coordinated activity of many interconnected neurons that give rise to the behavior that we're aware of when we look at animals or humans. In an animal like C. elegans, uh, we are talking about only 302 neurons for the hermaphrodite and 385 for the male. Those are the two genders that are available to the nematode. And the complete map of all 302 of these neurons was published in 1986 by White et al. That was, at the time, an stunningly heroic work to do that because uh, just doing the EM imaging, the segmentation, um, putting all those segments back together and then tracing what was there was absolutely ridiculous to do that. I mean, they didn't have... Uh, they didn't have any of the modern algorithms available to them. They didn't have the kind of compute infrastructure available. This was painstaking manual labor. So 302 neurons, that was a big deal for them by then. Back then. The mollusk has about 20,000 neurons. 
uh, an insect anywhere between, say, 100,000 to 800,000, if you're looking at the high-end insects, the very social bees, for instance. And for humans, about 86 billion neurons. These are all numbers that uh, they go up pretty drastically. And all of the issues related to that, of course, they increase with the same sort of ratio. C. elegans is still the only organism that has been completely mapped in that sense, although Drosophila is getting close. The fly brain is going to be uh, published very soon. The, the hemi brain, so the half brain, this is actually something that came up in uh, Rubin's talk at SFN, which was a special lecture. Uh, it's going to be published in, what was it, mid-January. And then a few months later, they're going to publish the connectome of the entire Drosophila. Um, and, and they will publish a bunch of tools with that as well so they can explore it. So Drosophila is coming up real soon, and that's when we're talking about an animal that has on the order of 100,000 neurons instead of 302. On this uh, slide, which I hope is popping up on your side now, uh, you can see the, the time scale of work on C. elegans. So back in 1960, that's... Uh, when uh, you know when the uh, the neural the nervous system of of the nematode was first being discussed, then in 1986 you have this incredible work to create the wire diagram by electron microscopy. Uh, there was also work around the same time to figure out uh, what the the sensory motor system of uh, of that uh, animal was by using laser ablation, which I'll get into in just a bit more uh, detail in a moment. Um, and then a variety of different studies that have been doing functional behavior, automated tracking of the animals, being able to track which neurons are active when the animal is doing certain things. This is uh, mainly being made possible uh, through the uh, GECIs. Those are genetically encoded calcium indicators. And optogenetics, which has then uh, added the ability to control neurons by light so that you can investigate and interrogate the system directly, all the way up to, say, 2015, where the Open Worm Project took off, uh, which is a, an open source attempt to get people to help build from the connectome, from the known connectome, uh, functional models that can make predictions, not just corroborating things we already know about the nematode, perhaps making model uh, novel predictions as well that can be uh, that can be informative as to how well the models work. So let's see. Great. With the electron microscope, you can visualize um, a high level of detail in the in the worm. Now the original EM sections were done at a somewhat uh, lower resolution than what we would now expect um, and for that reason uh, some of this talk gets into the problem of identifying gap junctions. Gap junctions are really only visible at very high resolutions under the electron microscope. Nowadays you can do serial electron mic uh, sorry serial scanning electron microscopy which can get you to say um, under 5 nanometers by 5 nanometers by 5 nanometers, maybe 3 by 3 by 3 for a voxel, uh, whereas a transmission electron microscopy gets you to 8 by 8 by something like 30 in depth, which is still enough to put together slices with the modern uh, algorithms that are available. So as you do uh, imaging of different layers of the neuron, as you slice through the organism, uh, you can get uh, a reconstruction of uh, serial sections, so successive sections, and this is something that has mainly been done in, for instance, the laboratories of Davy Bock, uh, or I think it's pronounced Davy Bock, and, uh, and then you get these nice three-dimensional reconstructions of the entire nervous system, sort of like the reconstruction that White et al. did back in 1986, but now at greater detail and greater resolution, of course. In addition to that, there's been a lot of detailed electrophysiology, uh, which was, uh, is now being applied to more and more neurons, a lot of interconnected neurons being interrogated at the same time. And this helps you see how the synapses and circuits function at high resolution. The aim is, of course, to be able to use the detailed connectome, the information that was already published back in 1986, and the newer information being 
produced by the higher resolution EM reconstruction to reveal how the circuits work. So not just to understand what the connectome is, but to understand how it mechanistically works. How do these neurons, how are they involved in different behaviors of the animal? And ultimately, the idea that we're interested in is, of course, how would you use the same approach, this serial sectioning and reconstruction into a three-dimensional map from electron micrographs to be able to recreate an emulation of the entire brain of an organism, be it a C. elegans or Drosophila or a mouse or a human. I guess this is a good point to just add in a little detail from the talk that Ruben gave at SFN. Um, it's mostly the speed up in the, in the technology, so the, the methods that are being used, the fact that they have uh, multi-beam electron microscopes or can use transmission electron microscopy, the fact that they have uh, vast computing, um, computing resources available and better algorithms that are being provided by the Google team that's involved in talk now. They're making it possible to go to the point where you can publish the entire Drosophila brain. And looking at the time since the Elegance was published and then the Drosophila and uh, parts of Drosophila to the full Drosophila and looking forward, at least by the predictions that Ruben is making, it seems like it will not take that much longer. It will be within the decade that you can do the um, full connectome of an animal the size of a mouse. And again, by accelerating, by just looking at that curve forward, the is that far behind. So my, it might seem a little wild right now to talk about that, but it's entirely possible that we can get image reconstruction stacks for the connectome of a human brain anywhere between 20, 25 years from now. So if it's just the data acquisition we're talking about from the structure, we can imagine that's going to be available relatively soon. Now the slide that I'm showing you now, if it pops up, this is the full connectome of C. elegans. This is showing uh, neurons that have been classified in three different types. You've got in red the uh, sensory motor neurons. Those are the neurons that um, are receiving sensation and that pass it downstream to the interneurons shown here in blue. Interneuron just means neurons that are somewhere within the system between sensory and motor and that are processing information. And those then pass it on to the neurons that are here labeled in green, the motor neurons, the neurons that are involved in generating a behavior for the animal. Because in C. elegans, being as simple as it is, pretty much the entire nervous system that we're showing here, pretty much the entire array of behaviors is about kinds of connections between sensory and motor. So something that is it's the, the animal sensing, be it a chemical sensation, a touch sensation, an osmotic sensation, and then performing some kind of behavior, either being attracted to it and heading towards or being uh, getting an adverse reaction, heading away from some danger, for instance. But this is the connectome, and the connections that are shown in here, these show all the chemical synapses. They don't show gap junctions. Gap junctions are types of synapses that uh, connect directly between a neuron and another neuron, transmitting the changes in the electric membrane potential, having an electric connection between the two membranes. Uh, so you can get subthreshold activity that affects from one neuron to the next neuron. Um, and it also doesn't show diffuse, uh, diffuse transmitters. So say neuromodulators that are traveling long distances from one neuron to another and they're not using um, the dendrites or axons. <clears throat> so it's, um, it's partial information, but showing us all the chemical synapses. I'm sorry about the sniffing, I have a bit of a cold. So there are 302 neurons shown in C. elegans. We've got the chemical synapses, but not the gap junctions. Sensory neurons were shown, interneurons and motor neurons. Typically, the 302 neurons are collapsed into 119 types based on similar morphologies and connections. 
That is a uh, categorization that was done based on what you could see in the structure and doesn't have too much to do with their functional uh, involvement, really. So it's not entirely clear just how useful it is to collapse them into those 119 types. The known basic function of C. elegans circuits is to control locomotion behavior in response to sensor inputs. And we can say that looking at just the connection does give us some understanding um, of how a signal is transduced, processed, and produces behavioral output. We can see where input is coming in, where it is sent to, so what may be involved in the processing and where it goes, and therefore what types of motor outputs might be connected with that uh, sensory input. But there are a number of complications that make it very difficult to predict what a circuit is doing. One is, as I said, the gap junctions of electrical synapses, those are not all known or shown. They comprise about 10% of synapses. They can act very fast, and they're potentially bidirectional because this is like an electrical link between two neurons. So who says it's only going in one direction? And seeing them requires additional steps. Either you have to do a higher resolution EM, which is the sort of work that Davy, Davy Box Lab has been doing, or you have to use an additional approach, such as immunolabeling, to show where these gap junctions are. If they're not as easily visible in, say, the work that White published back in 86, as the chemical synapses are. Also, there's the complication that there are reciprocal connections between neurons, for instance, reciprocal inhibition. So the neurons don't always just head in one direction, the connections between them. And that there, oops, what am I doing here? That there are parallel pathways where two neurons may be connected via two or more synaptic routes. So you can imagine that to get from neuron A to neuron B, or from a sensory motor, a sensory neuron in the top to a motor neuron at the bottom, that there are two different paths or more paths that you can take. And typically, you could say that most neurons in this entire system are, are separated by no more than two to three synaptic connections. So at some point, if you were only looking at the connections and not saying anything about when what circuit can be active, then you could say, oh my goodness, everything's connected. Everything's involved with everything. Now, despite all this, the C. elegans map was immediately used to define the touch avoidance response circuit. That's uh, where you know you, you touch a C. elegans either on the head or the tail, and it tries to avoid that light touch by heading in the opposite direction of where that touch was happening. So if you're touching the C. elegans on the head, then the, nerve, then the, uh, the C. elegans reverses, moves backwards. And if you touch the C. elegans on the tail, then it accelerates forward to try to get away from you. And there are a specific number of neurons involved in this. For the reversal, there are four neurons involved. For the forward acceleration, there are six neurons involved. And the way they discovered neurons these were is through laser ablation, meaning they use the laser to kill neurons selectively and find out what happened to the behavior when you did that. And just by doing that systematically, they were able to figure out what was the response circuit for these C. elegans. And you can do this because all C. elegans are basically the same. They all have 302 neurons and they all have pretty much the same behavior. So you can do that. So this analysis revealed the essential mechanosensory neurons in head and tail and the key interneurons needed to propagate information and motor neurons involved in forward and backward movement. And here on this slide, this is where you see those neurons. And we can see that uh, for anterior touch, there are two neurons that activate and they use these, these squiggly aligned purple connections. Those are gap junctions to connect with the neuron labeled AVD, which then propagates information forward leading to reversal. And if you do a posterior touch, so you touch them on the behind, then this PLM neuron um, sends information again through a gap junction to PVC which leads to VBDB and then acceleration so that the, the uh, nematode tries to get away from you. And there's also some crosstalk here. You see some connection where, uh, say, the neuron PLM is inhibiting the activity for reversal while it's 
exciting the, uh, the activity towards acceleration and vice versa. This is a fairly simple network, but of course this was discovered by doing this ablation study, not just by looking at the connectome. 60% of the neurons in C. elegans are known to be involved in one or more behaviors. But watch for a little bit first. Sorry? Okay, you're connected um, to the other interpreter. You can go ahead. Um, I'm not sure what I'm hearing right now. Is there somebody else on this channel who is not uh, listening to the Journal Club event? I think Alex was no, just getting sorry, a new you can, interpreter. you can go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. So the problem is, even though we know what 60% of the neurons in C. elegans are doing or what they're involved in in terms of behaviors, we don't really know what most of the connections do. So for instance, uh, for the head touch avoidance response that we were just talking about, only two of 58 synapses are really involved in that, in that action, and those are gap junctions. So we were showing those, those were these squiggly purple lines there. This means that when you just look at the connectome, it's very easy to come up with false hypotheses. Early guesses about how the information might flow through the wiring diagram were wrong. Um, the wiring diagram helps to generate these hypotheses about how the system may work, but it's not enough to solve the circuit. And there's another twist. There are divergent circuits where information has the same origin, but there are different outcomes. For example, uh, the gap junction from ADL leads to a different response than the chemical synapses from the ADL neuron. And I should briefly mention that the neurons here, they always have these codes that have three letters like ADL. So each one of the 302 neurons has a specific label. And that's really all that this means when I say ADL. So ADL is sending information via two different routes, gap junction or chemical synapse. And they, they create opposite responses to a pheromone. The chemical synapse leads to avoidance, moving away. And the gap junction circuit leads to aggregation. The nematodes come together. They, 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 uh, lead, they move towards each other. This is important here in, uh, in, um, you know, in the different behavior of hermaphrodites versus males uh, and how they behave in terms of reproduction. So it's... Uh, the question of are they trying to meet other nematodes or are they trying not to meet other nematodes. Now the ADL neuron can switch between these different responses in different contexts. Also a single class of neuron can be involved in the sensation of diverse stimuli or in eliciting different behaviors. The ASH neuron is an example of a neuron that can sense different types of stimuli. Uh, different aversive stimuli, aversive stimuli. So for instance, here in uh, figure A, you see that it can sense either an osmotic stress or that the nose touch um, is happening. And both of those, it wants to get away, wants to create an aversive response, and is using different channels within the ASH neuron to achieve that uh, by using different G-protein subunits that, uh, that express in overlapping ways. So you can have a single circuit pathway that is important for multiple different behavioral circuits. Now, as a programmer, as a modeler, you might look at this and go, well, this doesn't really matter to me. If, if this neuron is always leading to avoidance, does it matter if I'm activating it through the OSM10 or ITR1 uh, channel? And you're right, it doesn't necessarily. Sometimes when you read these papers, you notice that the neurophysiologists, when they're looking at this in terms of the chemistry involved, and the pathways in that sense, uh, sometimes they add a layer of complication that doesn't really exist when you're just studying it from the functional point of view. Um, that's a problem that happens also in discussions among neuroscientists, that sometimes things that are brought up as issues for, say, whole brain emulation don't turn out to really be issues when they say, well, what about Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a messenger that has such an important function in the human body. It really makes the difference between whether you decide to do this or decide to do that. But if you just regard it as a messenger, you could replace acetylcholine with any other messenger as long as you replace the receptor with, an, with a similar receptor that can react to this new messenger the same way the old receptor reacted to acetylcholine. So it's not really about the acetylcholine. 
any more than here. It's about OSM 10 or ITR 1. It's really about what is the message that you're sending? What function is it that you're trying to carry out? So yes, this is complicating things that you have to look at different chemical signals to understand what the circuit's doing. But once you get to the point of modeling it, it ends up being very similar. Basically, it just means either osmotic stress or nose touch both lead to avoidance. So this intrinsic ambiguity does make it difficult to just read a connectome and understand what it's doing. You can't just look at the connections, this intrinsic wiring diagram and say, oh, this is storing the memory of, or this is storing the behavioral function of that. Studies that record activity are necessary to understand the information flow. Now, we've got different ways of recording activity in cells. The original way to do this is patch clamp studies, where you're really patching across the membrane of a neuron in order to be able to detect the flow of ions, to be able to detect what the change in the memory potential is based on this flow of ions. So you're reading currents. That can give you insights into how C. elegant neurons are responding to activity, and it shows that they respond to graded activity as opposed to all or nothing activation. C. elegans doesn't operate based on spikes. It operates largely based on these sub-threshold activities inside cells. And with the, uh, the importance of gap junctions, that's not really that surprising. Now, more modern, we can use other approaches because nematodes happen to be very transparent that means it's really useful for doing uh, recording methods, using recording methods that use light. And uh, one way to do this is using genetically encoded calcium indicators such as GCAMP so that you can have specific cell types uh, illuminate whenever, uh, whenever they're active. When you, in, when you combine this with optogenetic interrogation, so where you can uh, genetically tag certain cells to be very sensitive to types of, to certain frequencies of light, then you can um, selectively depolarize, that is, excite, bring more activity into a neuron, or hyperpolarize, that's inhibit a neuron. You can selectively do that to specific types of cells, and you can read out what certain types of cells are doing with this GCAMP approach. So now you have a way to selectively target and activate certain neurons and see what the outcome is, what the response is. That means you can easily do that for larger populations of neurons. You can do that very quickly uh, in many different contexts for many nematodes in, a, in an experiment. And it's very useful for, uh, for behavioral experiments on those, on those uh, nematodes. And this um, graph here shows that the first Part of the graph A is just showing you the graded response that you get in these, uh, these optogenetically tagged cells when you're illuminating them with the right frequency of light. It's a very profound activity that you get there. The, uh, the traces in B show that when you're activating a specific neuron that is sensitive to that frequency of light, then you'll get a downstream activation. So for instance, if you are shining light on neuron one, and you're going to get a similar activation of the connected neurons, say neuron 10, and so forth. So you can investigate which neurons are connected and are, are functionally connected, not just connected through the connectome, but are at that moment transmitting activity, processing activity and signals uh, in that behavioral context. And we'll get into the details of the rest there. Now, this is getting to the point where it's almost possible to watch the entire brain of a C. elegans. Right now, you can see about 80 neurons at a time. That's a very significant portion of the 302. While they're roaming freely, so the, there are experimental setups that can track the nematode and can see which direction the head is pointing and the body posture, and can also investigate the activity of neurons at that time. So you can watch what's going on in certain contexts. Now, there are still some things that need to be improved. So being able to interrogate and watch what's happening at, um, at these gap junctions, at electrical synapses, that needs to be improved. Uh, in fact, these gap junctions are even difficult to see under the electron microscope. And so 
that is still a bit of a challenge. Um, and then we would like to understand a lot more about how electrical synapses, these gap junctions, are regulated by voltage, neuromodulation, phosphorylation, and small molecules. So basically, those synapses still need a lot of study. And then there is this whole other chapter, neuromodulation. You know, I was just mentioning acetylcholine, which figures prominently in the human brain. There are, of course, neuromodulators in C. elegans as well. And neuromodulators reconfigure how entire circuits work. Neuromodulators are such things as biogenic amines, such as serotonin, dopamine, neuropinephrine, histamine, and many neuropeptides, dozens of neuropeptides. These neuromodulators are released either at chemical synapses, and in that case, they're released simultaneously with the fast chemical transmitter that is used for what we would normally call the, the typical transmission in the cells, or they're released by neuroendocrine cells. Those are the ones that are not even involved with the direct synaptic connections and direct synaptic transmission, but that will release these diffuse uh, transmitters, these neuromodulators. And as I just mentioned, they're diffuse, so they diffuse over distances, sometimes shorter distances, sometimes longer distances. And the targets of those neuromodulators may be invisible to EM, depending a little bit on the type of EM that you've done, the resolution of EM. Um, signaling through G-protein regulated biochemical processes isn't directly visible the way that ionotropic receptors are visible. So you don't just see the receptor that's supposed to receive the neuromodulator. Instead, there is a, another process, a genetic process that is happening um, in, in those cells. And the change of neural function, so which circuits are being activated or deactivated and how the response changes, this can be something that takes place over seconds, over minutes, or over hours. So it could be a very brief thing where the function of the circuitry is changed for a few seconds at a time, or it could be that the nematode is going to change its behavior for multiple hours at a time. For instance, if it's... Um, if it's uh, if it's well fed, then it may be receiving a neuromodulator that takes it, tells it to just hang around, just dwell, not go looking for any new food. So these modulators, they can select circuit pathways. Uh, serotonergic, serotonergic signaling promotes dwelling, this is what I was just talking about here, whereas neuropeptide PDF1 promotes roaming, as an example. Neurons producing and responding to modulators from a distributed circuit are independent of the classical wiring diagram. So the, the wires, the connections that we see, don't tell us where these neuromodulators are going. And sometimes it causes very unexpected results. So for instance, uh, the motor and interneurons can modulate sensor neurons. They go back upstream. Modulators can alter neurons' intrinsic properties. They can change how the neurons work what their dynamics are. They can, for instance, switch a neuron from a spiking mode, where they fire occasionally, to plateau potentials or to bursts. And this is a, a general remark about neuromodulators. This is more applicable to the, uh, you know, to, to animals such as humans and not so much the nematode, but it's an important thing to remember. So these effects can activate or silence circuits. They can change the frequency or phase relationship of patterns generated. And phase relationships and frequencies are very important for the more complex processing that happens in many circuits of the brain. Think, for instance, about how working, working memory is thought to work in the, uh, the cortex. There, the frequency of activation and also the phase at which a certain pattern appears is extremely important. So really what you need to understand what's going on here is we need more ways to monitor neuromodulation in vivo. Anatomy alone doesn't predict the behavior in neurons, of neurons over time due to the sensitivity to intrinsic channels and electrical properties that vary within and between cell types. Channels, synapses, and biochemical processes interact to generate explicitly time-delimited features, dynamics, in neurons and circuits. So what this means is synaptic connectivity alone does not sufficiently constrain a system. Even if you just look at two connected neurons, it's not possible to derive the dynamics from the wiring diagram without knowing things such as the strength and time course of synaptic connections, 
the numbers and kinds of membrane currents in each of the neurons. So sometimes unique dynamic properties are characteristic of specific cell types. So cell types that you could recognize by looking at them in the three-dimensional reconstruction and you could say, oh, this morphology tells us it's this type of cell. And then you can take from your library a known set of dynamic properties and say, okay, this neuron fits within that type of activity and there's only a very small range over which we can tune the parameters to get the sort of activity we're looking for. And there are such neurons, for instance, many cortical interneuron types that, that do have this correlation, a close correlation between a specific kind of dynamic and a specific kind of morphology, i.e. connectivity along its branches of dendrites and axons. At other times, though, neural dynamics can vary between similar cell types or even within a cell type. For instance, and I was just mentioning working memory, the persistent activity during working memory at pyramidal cells and cortex, this is something that is governed by neuromodulators that put those pyramidal cells into a mode, a mode that they use while, for instance, you are awake and paying attention versus when you're sleeping and reactivating old patterns to consolidate them and so forth. So there is a, there, there is a difference between the way that these cells operate depending on some other modulators that are present. Or between tonic versus phasic firing mode switches in neurons in the brainstem, again, depending on specific behavioral state. The same basic idea that um, you can have a change either in the circuit activity or in even the activity of the individual neuron based on when this is happening and what other stuff is going on around it in terms of the modulators or some context, some contextual activity that has happened uh, earlier. And then, of course, there's synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity at various scales, but at rapid time scales as well, this can modify synapses based on their use. And that, again, complicates things. In C. elegans, that also happens. You can train the nematodes to uh, become aversive to a certain type of chemical or not. So uh, you can train them to have slightly different um, emphases on, on which synapses will be how strong and will, uh, will have what effect. Not so much as in, say, the, you know, the vertebrate animals that we typically study. Um, it's much more complicated there. In any case, connectome studies require complementary studies that monitor, manipulate, and model neuronal circuitry. And that is the end of the presentation in terms of the two papers, but I think I should add just a little bit of my own interpretation to that. I did that a bit throughout the whole talk, but um, overall, I would say it confirms, first of all, this notion that, yes, just looking at the structure alone certainly isn't enough. If you want to turn this back into a funding system, you at the least need to have a library of dynamics that you can correlate, associate with the structure um, in some way. And as mentioned there, sometimes it's easy, like with those interneurons, or easy, easy is the wrong word, but easier, because there really is only one type of dynamic activity, and that goes with that type of neuron. And sometimes you need to have a repertoire of possible dynamics. And that repertoire is something that you can only discover by running the system through its paces and observing it in a context. So that's where you need to do these activity studies. And collecting all of that will take a while. Um, that is something that is very much not done yet. I wonder if there's a way to do that most of the time, either by uh, systematically carrying out these dynamic studies and context studies, or by digging deeper, by finding some neurons and their circuits at a molecular level so that you can predict the different types of modes that emerge at the, at the neuronal and synaptic level, so that you can predict the types of dynamic behavior that can exist if certain chemicals are present or if... Um, you know, it, it, gets, it gets very complicated. You can imagine that at that point it becomes uh, dramatically just, you know, exploding from a model can just a way to be more systematic about it. In any case, we need both. We need um, 
a lot of dynamic studies, and that's the sort of thing where uh, electrophysiology comes in and the work that the Berger team does on their hippocampal models comes in. And we also need uh, more work on connectomics and on how to map from one to the other. And that's pretty much it. Thanks, everyone. Now, if there are any questions, I don't know if anyone's still there or anyone can hear me. Yep, I'm still here. So let me just quickly ask, did anyone else actually read these papers? Yeah. And what was your takeaway from them? Well, I, that it's pretty complicated. You know, that um, just like you mentioned, a lot of the different challenges to actually, um, you know, emulating the, uh, the uh, you know, the, even the small of a brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. When uh, Abu Favre and I uh, met up at neuroscience, uh, he was mentioning on, I think it was the day, either the day before the aspirational neuroscience conference or the day of, he was mentioning that just, you know, being there and seeing all of the stuff that's going on. I think it was him. Yeah. I think Abel Faz was the one I mentioned. He said it, it made things seem more complicated and it was a little bit discouraging in that sense because it just seemed like there's so much more to do. Yeah. And, uh, and at the time, I mentioned, I said, "Well, okay, you know, this is this is what you have to go through. That's normal because you know, that's the Dunning Kruger thing. The more you know about something, the more you realize how complicated it really is." But yeah. but even even then, towards the end of the conference, you know, I felt myself coming back out of it a little bit because, despite then, you know, really realizing how complex the whole problem is. Then you listen to someone like Ruben and giving the talk about where Genelia is getting to and stuff. And it, you know, it sort of shows you that it's hard, but it's not necessarily infinitely hard. It's just something that requires serious, dedicated effort. Um, at least that's where I'm still at. Well, so, you know, kind of based on, on these two papers, do you think if, let's say you had, you know, a mouse connectome and let's say, you know, at least for one mouse, you know, you did all the dynamic studies and everything like that. What would be the issues with just taking another mouse, just getting the connectome and, you know, then modeling it based on a completely different mouse? I mean, are there going to be issues with trying to get the memories without actually having, um, you know, dynamic you know, studies in the individual brain? I'm going to go out on a limb here. I okay. don't actually think that it'd be that much of a problem. Uh, I think that when we say the C. elegans, the nematodes are all the same, mm -hmm. uh, the same is kind of true for all mice. Yes, sure, we all set up different circuits because we have so many columns, many columns in our brain, and we can set up different circuits between them to remember complex memories that a nematode could never even try to remember. But those things would be the sorts of things that you could pick up by looking at synaptic strength, at the number of synapses, at synapse size, and so forth. Whereas the physiological details, such as um, what type of neuron has what sort of dynamic function, and how do those dynamic functions change in the presence of neuromodulators, and so forth, that sort of thing is preserved between different mini columns, the neurons in those columns, and is preserved in a sense between different mice. There may be slightly different default states for each. They may have different, uh, uh, you know, natural tendencies. But in a principle, those should be preserved to a degree. So in that sense, every mouse is the same as every other mouse, just as every C. elegans is like every other C. elegans. And I would say that has to necessarily be so because if if all humans weren't basically the same. If our brains weren't producing basically the same types of modeling of the world and understanding of the world, then we probably wouldn't be able to have really meaningful conversations 
and really be a, a community of people. And yes, this gets a little philosophical, but that's sort of where I'm going with this. Is so there's really, necessarily a pressure for these things to be similar. Yeah. So and, and just a lot of the work goes up front in the first emulation of a particular species, and then you know just to get all of these details. That's my take on it. Yeah. This, these papers basically show us that the first step to get anything emulated is going to be very, very hard. But, yes, that first time is going to be the hardest. Well, that's fascinating that they're doing the, um, you know, the transparent studies where they're actually looking at, or, you know, soon to look at the entire, you know, 300 neurons in real time. I mean, that, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, and surprisingly, this is actually people we know. So I don't know if you guys know the name David Dalrymple. Um, mm -hmm. He's uh, he's fairly active in, I would say, transhumanist circles. Uh, he studied at MIT and Harvard, and he had uh, Marvin Minsky as one of his mentors. And he set up these experiments to try to follow nematodes on a slide and be able to uh, monitor their body posture and direction and also to be able to record activity from them. He didn't complete that study. He went on to do other things after he spent a year doing this. But another group took over his work. And they're really the ones that, uh, that kind of pushed this through to the point where you now have an experimental setup that can do that. So it's uh, okay, well, good. interesting so to note are... that, yeah, these are people that are actually interested in whole brain emulation because David Dalrymple was. So there's a link here. Well, yeah, because that would be a great... Uh, proof of concept if you know if, if people could uh, you know actually do emulate the uh, nematode it would answer a lot of skepticism you know if you actually have um, a working emulation yeah so this is something I didn't really get from the papers these papers told us a lot in a general sense about where the complexity is and why it's difficult to determine function from structure but they didn't tell me very much in terms of where is something like the Open Worm Project at? Yeah. Um, yeah. What can they do right now and what can't they do? What's still missing in terms of an emulation of the nematode? So maybe these were just the wrong papers. That's possible. Maybe we should pick a paper from the Open Worm Project next. Well, yeah, yeah. Like you said, just to see um you know what what is this you know the state of the art with um you know what are people doing to actually try to um you know move the move the field along so but no those were really good review articles though i mean i don't think we mm -hmm. we were wrong with uh, with starting with those two articles yeah but i have a feeling that uh, in the next year or two we should be very closely watching what's happening at chenalia with drosophila um i'm sure the c elegant is smaller, more manageable in that sense, mm -hmm. but um, but the same methods have to be developed for Drosophila, and they have way more systematic applied capital behind them. I have a feeling that that's going to move ahead pretty rapidly. <laughs>